And now all of you have Bibles. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Um, I'm, we're going to share uh, a couple of stories from the New Testament today, and one of them is uh, well-known by people all over the world, and it's called the Parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a really famous story that Jesus told, and I'm going to share that story and then the event that happened right after it today, um, but it's in Luke chapter 10. And so today we're continuing our series on uh, the greatest fears. Uh, it says our five greatest fears, really probably I should have said our um, five universal fears because it's not simply our greatest fears if, if i polled all of you um fear of public speaking would probably be in your top five so it's probably not your greatest fears um but they're universal fears meaning every culture on the planet people of every color every race every gender the whole world has these five fears no matter where you go you'll find these five fears and one uh that we've already covered is death uh, we're going we're to cover fear of the future, fear of chaos. Today is our fear of the outsider. And in every single culture on earth and subculture, people are afraid of people outside their group. They're terrified of some group uh, that they consider to be dangerous or scary. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to look at a story Jesus told that addresses this fear. And it's popularly called the parable of the Good Samaritan which you'll find out what an ironic that name is a little bit later. But if you would, take your Bibles, uh, chapter 10, verse 25. I would invite you, if you don't mind and you're able to, to stand in honor of God's word uh, as we read it aloud together. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So we asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and now it will not be taken away from her. Let's pray. Uh, Father, help us to understand how to deal with this very real fear that we struggle with and how to live out the good news in our own lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you stood, you can be seated now. Thank you. Um, so... The fear of outsiders. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, every culture distinguishes between those on the inside and those on the outside because people on the inside make us feel safe and those on the outside, not so safe. Now, here's the, I don't know what outsiders are to you. I'm going to go through a long list here uh, of different kinds of people that may be on the outside to some of you and others to others. I don't know who's on the, who's the insider, who's the outsider to you. Uh, all I know is this. However you define outsider, it would be the answer to this question. Blank threatens our way of life. Okay? Now, I don't know who you put in the blank. 
you might have a long list of 20 things. I don't know. You may have just one or two. Um, probably very few of your lists are identical. But whoever you consider to be an outsider is the person that you think threatens your or our way of life. That's the difference between insider and outsider. Now, simply put, an outsider could be just someone who's not a believer. You know, if you're a Christian and someone's not a Christian, you could see that person as an outsider. I don't think that's really the way Jesus sees it, as we'll talk about in a moment. But I think a lot of Christians talk about us and them. And by the way, I don't think us and them is ever good language for us to use. I don't think it's ever helpful. But we all do it. We all do it. We can't even help ourselves. We talk about us and them. Think about the kinds of people you would refer to as them. For some people, the people on the outside would be people in the LGBTQ movement. Maybe those are the scary people to you. Those are the people on the outside. Those are the dangerous people. For others, it might be a different race than you. Um, that's probably not as likely in this group. Um, it might be people from other religions, uh, Muslims. Maybe you would say Muslims or radical Muslims threaten our way of life. A lot of people um, are terrified. Uh, I, I've taught several classes at Park University, and we covered one recent story a few years ago of uh, how France outlawed certain um, uh, religious garments, which is something the United States probably would never do is outlaw a religious garment. Um, but France did it not uh, because those garments are scary, but because they want to discourage people who want to wear those garments from being in their country. It's about fear. Um, think about this. Maybe it's people in the other political party. I mean, that's really common for people to draw the line with the people in the other – Republicans threaten our way of life. Democrats threaten our way of life. Or maybe uh, someone with a different political view. Maybe it's the liberals. Maybe it's conservatives. Like what would you put in the blank? Maybe it's the Antifa. Maybe it's white supremacists. What group do you put in the blank? Those people threaten our way of life. The wealthy, illegal aliens. Everyone has someone that they tend to think – those people could ruin our way of life. Um, it, it's political season, right? And so plenty of people are like, hey, we got to elect so-and-so or re-elect so-and-so, and the other person will destroy America, which is kind of strong language, like really destroy America? We've made it through some really lousy presidents, folks. I mean, it's not likely anybody's going to destroy America, but we're afraid, right? And we think those people, right, those people, whoever those people are for you, that's the outsider. And so this passage is all about outsiders. And here's the big idea I want you to think about this morning. As followers of Jesus, we are ruled by compassion rather than fear. This is really, really important. Um, it's okay to be afraid of certain people, certain groups. It's okay. I mean, fear is natural. A lot of times fear is legitimate even. But what's not okay is for those of us who follow Jesus to be ruled by fear. We can have it. We can even talk about it in polite company. We should be ruled by compassion, not by fear. I think of this story. Uh, Jesus was asked by a religious leader, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what does the law say? What does the scripture say? What does Moses teach? The man said, well, uh, love God and love one another, which, by the way, both of those are found in Deuteronomy and different places, and he stuck them together. Love God, love people. And Jesus is like, bingo, you got it, you know. You nailed it. Just do that. In fact, at one point, Jesus was asked by a person, how would he summarize the law? And he said the same thing, love God, love people. So this guy was either paying attention to Jesus or he was just naturally brilliant. And he just said, yeah, love God, love people. And Jesus said, go do that and you'll be fine. Of course, the guy knows he wasn't perfectly doing that. Uh, the law is too hard. There were 613 laws in the Mosaic Canon, 613. So the man wanted to know, okay, if I have to love my neighbor, who's my neighbor? See, if I can limit those on the inside, if I can limit my neighbor to a small enough group, I could probably keep that. So he said, well, who do I have to love? But he didn't ask it that way because that's ugly. Who do I have to love? He said, who's my neighbor? And uh, Jesus said, I'm glad you asked. And he told a story. And in the story we call the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus did not answer his question. Because the person who was beaten and left on the side of the road after he'd been robbed, is it's not clear who he is. He's unnamed. We don't know his race. We don't know his religion. We don't know anything about the guy. He's naked. There's no distinguishing marks. He, he's anonymous. So Jesus isn't answering his questions because at the very end, here's the question he asked the same man who asked him the question. He said, who was a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? He didn't answer, who is your neighbor? He answered, what does it look like to be one? And he really ticked off the guy. 
because he had a Samaritan be the good guy. Now, all of Jesus' parables ticked people off. That's why he told them he loved to mess with people, uh, to upset them. It was one of Jesus' favorite pastimes. So he told the story about some anonymous guy who got beat up, robbed, left for dead, and the good guy, the priest, passes by. Another good guy, a Levite, passes by, does nothing. And then a good-for-nothing Samaritan has mercy. Now, Jesus doesn't say good-for-nothing Samaritan because that's not how he views Samaritans, but that's the way his audience saw Samaritans. You know, Gentiles were bad and pathetic people to most Jews, but they weren't nearly as bad as Samaritans, you know, because the Romans couldn't help themselves. I mean, they were born Roman. I mean, what can they do about it? The Greeks were born Greeks. Samaritans, though, were especially heinous because these were people who at one time were part of Israel. But over time of inbreeding, they had mixed their race and their religion and had an impure version of Judaism with their own separate Bible, their own separate practices that was no longer orthodox in the eyes of the Jews. And so the Samaritans were not just half-breeds racially, they were half-breeds in their religion. They, uh, they were close, but not nearly close enough. They were like really, really, really bad Jews. And so no Jewish person liked Samaritans. In fact, really good Jewish people never even went through Samaria. If they had to go somewhere north of Samaria, they went around Samaria because the saying was, you don't want to get Samaritan dust on your shoes. Like that's how bad it was. And it wasn't just a saying, they really went around Samaria. So Jesus picks the good guy to be a Samaritan. And now everybody's like looking at Jesus like, why are you making the Samaritan the good guy? So they're all mad at Jesus for saying that. And you know that because at the end of the story, he says, well, who was a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And the man didn't say the Samaritan because he's not going to. He goes, the one who had mercy on him? The one at the end? The last guy you mentioned? Like he didn't even say Samaritan because he can't say it. He won't say it. Which was pointing out that to Jesus, everyone is ultimately our neighbor. And this man wanted to admit there were certain people he would never include in his circle. And Jesus brought that to his own attention. Like the story and the question at the end just helped this guy see that he draws the circle way too tight. Um, think about the Samaritan for a moment. Uh, he stopped what he was doing and walked over to someone who, it could have been a setup, right? It could have been robbed. Uh, then he's helping this guy who could be dead. And if he's dead, that would make him ceremonially unclean. Now he can't even like you know, go and worship for so many weeks at church. I mean, that's things, not technically church, but you know, for him, church. Also, this guy could have had some kind of disease, right? He could have had COVID-19, right? He could have been contagious. He could have had some kind of contagion. I mean, no tell of what this, where this guy's been, who he's been with, what he has, and you're going to touch all over him and he's got, you know, he's bleeding. I mean, yeah, ugh. I mean, think of all the contagions this guy could have had. And he helped him. And then he took him on his animal, put him in his car, drove into the next town, went to the hospital, brought this guy to the ER, and the ER said, well, do we have any identification for this guy? He goes, no, he doesn't have a wallet. He's been robbed. He's naked. I mean, he's nothing. And they're like, well, we can't just take him. He's like, here's $1,000 cash, two silver coins. That was two days wages. He gave him like $1,000, basically the ER, and said, take care of this guy. And uh, they said, well, you know, what if 1000 is not enough, sir? And he's like, here's my credit card number. If it's more than that, charge me. Like, who, who does that? Like, he gave the hospital his credit card number for someone he didn't even know. And he says, I'll be back to pay the rest later. He showed this incredible mercy to a person he didn't even know, to whom he owes nothing. This guy could be a bad person, a good person. He could be rich or poor. He could be Jewish, Samaritan, Gentile. Like, there's no way to know who this guy is or where he's from. And the Samaritan in the story doesn't care. And that's the point. The point is um, Jesus doesn't care who he is or where he's from. Uh, let me tell you a couple stories at the Oasis. Um, so Hope and I and our home church, a long time ago, the home church we were in adopted these two people and two more. Um, this is Layla and I forget her sister's name. Uh, they were uh, refugees from Afghanistan. This was a long time ago. Um, and actually, they had a special needs brother who I believe was in a wheelchair. And then Layla had a son who was a teenager at the time. So we actually adopted four refugees. And this whole family was originally from Afghanistan. The dad had died. And the family um, had to run away from Afghanistan during the Russian-Afghan war. 
and they were refugees in India. They moved to Delhi and they settled in Delhi and applied to the UN to be refugees, which is how you have to do it. Uh, so India was the country of asylum, it's called. And so they waited 10 years to get approved. You know, the UN has to go and make sure you are who you say you are, that you're not lying, that you're, you're really not a dangerous person, that you can't go back home for fear of death or whatever. So when they were finally approved, they decided to send them to a country uh, of, of refugee status, which was America. It was Tucson. They were sent to Tucson. And they actually wanted to come to America. That was like the top country on their list. And a lot of people list America number one, but they rarely get to come here. So this family who in many ways was almost Indian in their culture, but Afghan uh, by, by faith, well, Muslim and Afghan by their previous culture, they ended up moving to Tucson and we adopted them through Tucson Refugee Ministries, which is a Christian ministry here in town that loves on refugees. So we adopted this family and the refugee uh, organization agency had to provide them with an apartment and basic necessities, but that's all. So we came along and showed them how to get a bus pass, how to uh, enroll their son in school and did it for them. Like we actually helped them and walked them through some of this stuff that the agency doesn't do. So we actually loved them for a while and they were a really sweet family. Um, they were so sweet. I mean, every time we came over, they wanted to feed us their food and they didn't have much. They were so kind to us. They wanted us to show them around and they treated us like kings. Um, they absolutely adored us, but it was like, you know, sucking the life out of us because it was like an hour each way to their apartment. And pretty soon the, the home church dropped them and it was just David and hope. And it was just a burden. And eventually after about three or four months, we had to stop uh, loving on this family. Well, here's what happened. Um, there was a home church leader at the time. We'll say his name is Steve. And I don't know, about six months to a year later, uh, he decides to come over to the house. He says, I have to talk to you about something. And I said, sure. So he came over and he looked really depressed. And I said, hey, come on in, Steve. And he said, hello. you know, the family said hello to him. And he sort of said hello, but he wasn't very excited. He looked depressed. So we went into the office and I said, hey, Steve, what's up? And he said, well, uh, my family and I were leaving the Oasis and I just wanted to tell you. And I was like, man, that's not funny. I mean, what's going on? Tell me the truth. And I laughed because I thought he wasn't serious, right? And he goes, no, seriously, we're leaving the Oasis. I went, dude, that's not even funny to kid about. What's really going on? He goes, no, seriously, we are leaving the Oasis. And I'm like, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. And I just was like, like dumbfounded. And I'm like, where did this come from? What's going on? Well, he shared a whole list of things, none of which were like deal breakers. And I kept wondering, what's the real thing going on here? What's really, what's this really about? And then at one point he got to the refugee thing. And then he got really angry and he pointed his finger at me and he said, and then you guys went and adopted those Muslim refugees. Those people have sworn to destroy our country and you helped them. And I'm like, well, we were trying to be like Jesus, Steve. And he's like, well, that's the last straw. Wow. I didn't realize fear was such a big thing for Steve in that area. Well, I keep learning that lesson the hard way. Then a few years later, there was a, a, a guy coming to our church. He wasn't a member. His name was, we'll just say his name was uh, Willie. It was make up a name. He was coming to the church for a while. And uh, one day, uh, this was actually four years ago um, this summer. I don't know if you remember what was going on four years ago, uh, but there was an election four years ago too, right? So it was the middle of a heated election, and um, you know, a lot of politicians were saying different things. And the Arizona State Legislature was considering a bill which would make it illegal for Muslim refugees to be settled in the state of Arizona. So I'm up, and I'm giving a sermon about missions and evangelism. And at one point, I said, you know, we've got a lot of people talking these days about not having Muslims be relocated to our country, into our state, into our city. But I've, our families adopted one of these families, and I can tell you they're sweet people who just need Jesus. And if we try to go to some of their countries, it's illegal for us to share the gospel. And we still send missionaries, but they have to be really careful, and they often get in trouble and sometimes go to jail, and sometimes they get killed. So it's really expensive and dangerous to send missionaries to those countries, but the world is sending their people here if we will simply let the door remain open. And we can much more easily and much more freely share our faith here in our country. And I said, so those of us who are people of faith should be very careful before we talk about how they shouldn't come here because that's the safest place to do missions. Well, this guy came up to me after the service and he, he shook my hand really hard. Like he was, it was not a firm handshake. It was like trying to hurt me handshake. And he said, pastor, 
you need to stay out of politics and I'm warning you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he put his hand on my shoulder and gave me a claw grip. And he said, if you don't stop talking about politics, we're leaving. And he left. I never saw Steve or Willie ever again in our church. They both left. Now, um, I think both of those men were ruled by fear with all my heart. And you know what? Not every fear is illegitimate. I mean, we have legitimate fears. There are people right now that if you're honest, you're afraid they're going to destroy our way of life. There's no doubt about it. There are people that you fear. And your fears may be valid. But we should never be ruled by them. And that was my concern with both of these men was that they were more afraid than they were ruled by compassion. What does the gospel require of me? And the parable of the Good Samaritan tells us, it tells us this, our compassion knows no boundaries. Anyone in need is a potential friend. Anyone in need. Our compassion at least should know no boundaries. Jesus described the hurt man as, you know, anonymous. We don't know anything about him. Our compassion should know, should know zero boundaries. Anyone in need, anyone who we come across that's in need is potentially our friend, an insider. Anyone who's not an insider today is potentially an insider tomorrow. So Jesus showed hospitality to all people without regard to where they came from. Now, hospitality is a really important word in the Bible. We don't use it a lot in our culture. Uh, it, we usually use it of like the hotel industry, right? The hospitality industry. Um, <clears throat> hospitality was way more important back then than it is today, but it's still important for those of us who follow Jesus. Hospitality is the way you treat guests. And in those days, inns were actually pretty dangerous places. And so you really wanted to stay in the home of someone you knew. And if you knew someone in a town, that was the first place you went to stay. And if you knew them and they knew you, they were sort of obligated to let you stay in their home. Like that was just the expectation. That was the virtue in that culture. Even if you weren't a devout Jewish person, you were supposed to let people stay in your house. So whether it was a meal or whether it was to stay overnight or both, that was hospitality. Treating the guest like the guest matters. And that was an important virtue in the New Testament. Even throughout Paul's writings and Peter's writings, we see evidence that hospitality was an important Christian virtue. And it's important to us today. It's important for us to treat everyone like a guest, everyone like an image bearer made in the image of God. And our compassion should know no boundaries. Even the people you most fear, the people you would put on the outside, they eventually, hopefully, will come to the inside, but only if we love them in. We can't treat them like outsiders. We have to actually love people like they're already on the inside. We have to treat everyone like a guest. Hospitality should know no boundaries boundaries and of course we live in a culture where everybody seems to be mad at everybody i mean just look at the kinds of things people are saying on the internet people are really angry with each other and it's not helping and i get that the world is angry but for those of us who follow jesus there's really no excuse for it there's none those of us who love jesus uh, abraham lincoln lived in a time where people were a little upset with each other in fact they were so upset with each other they pulled guns on each other and killed each other i mean that's pretty upset we haven't quite come to that yet, but they actually had literal civil war, not just metaphorical. It was literal. And at one time in the height of the civil war, Abraham Lincoln stood up and gave a speech. And in that speech, he referred to Southerners as fellow human beings who were wrong about slavery. Our fellow human beings who were wrong about slavery. Well, after the <clears throat> speech, a lady came up to him and she was upset about his language. Sounds like she could have lived in them. Um, 2020. She said to him, you know, I think you used the wrong language, Mr. President. You should have referred to them as irreconcilable enemies who deserve to be destroyed. I'll say it again. Her language was that, she sh that he should have called them irreconcilable enemies who deserve to be destroyed. Does that sound like the way people on both sides of the aisle talk these days? And then he said this, why, madam, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? That's gold. I think he probably got this from his many hours reading the New Testament. Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? You want to destroy your enemies? Make them your friends. 
roll out the welcome mat. Love them with the compassion of Jesus himself. Treat them as friends instead. Now, that's what we're going to, uh, we're going to talk practically about how to do that in just a moment. Uh, two ways from that second story to flesh out compassion and hospitality. But before we do, we're going to take our brief two-minute intermission um, because I know that uh, you guys need to go to the bathroom and get more coffee. So I've hit countdown here. It's two minutes and counting. So get up quickly. Go to the bathroom, get that extra coffee, and we'll be back in less than two minutes. All right. Okay. So here's the question. How do you practically live out being ruled by compassion, not fear? How do you really live out no boundaries in the way we love others and treat everyone as a potential friend, a potential family member, a potential insider? Well, the second story tells us two practical things we can do. First is this. Compassion requires being present to our guest. If we're going to be ruled by compassion, we have to be present. This is really important. Notice in the second story, Jesus goes and spends some time with Mary and Martha at their house. Um, they were good friends of, uh, of, of Jesus's, and uh, they had a brother that's also famous too because Jesus actually raised him from the dead. Um, but Jesus goes to their house and spends some time with them. And uh, they show him hospitality, right? They welcome him to his home. They feed him. You know, they, they let him stay there overnight. Uh, they show good hospitality. But they show it differently, right? Mary is the one doing all the serving. And uh, uh, Martha, Martha is the one doing all the serving. And then Mary is just sitting at the feet of Jesus listening. And then Martha gets ticked off because Mary's not helping at all. And instead of, you know, saying something to Mary, she goes to Jesus and gets, you know, she knows if Jesus says something to Mary, Mary will listen. So she's like, Jesus, tell her. Can you believe that, saying, speaking to Jesus that way? Tell her to get off her butt and come help me. Um, that's kind of bold, to tell Jesus what to do. I mean, whoa, that's pretty radical. So Jesus ends up telling Martha she's worried about way too many things. He's distracted about way too many things, and that Mary has chosen the better thing because she's chosen to sit and listen to what Jesus has to say. And Jesus wants to be heard more than he wants to be served. Now, that's really important because if we're going to love people well, we have to be present. We have to be emotionally present. Um, Dale Carnegie used to say, um, ask people questions and get them to talk about themselves, and they'll listen for hours. In other words, most people really just want to talk about themselves. Most people just want to talk about their stuff. So if you will learn to be present and ask people questions, you can really build friendship. And you know what? That's lacking in our culture because most people um, silo. I don't know if you know what that word means, but most people silo, which means if they see people on their social media who disagree with them, they unfriend them. And so the only people they're left friends with are people who agree with them. And so they just silo, and they only pay attention to the voices that agree with their voice. And that's a really small, narrow world to live in. But what it means is people get stronger in their opinions because they don't hear the opposite opinion. And when they talk to someone, they argue their point of view rather than asking the other person questions. But Jesus would be the kind of person to sit at someone's feet and ask them questions and get them talking. And he would want to know what formed that opinion. Where did that come from? What is their experience? Because everyone who's strongly opinionated, I can promise you, has a lot of fear. So ask them, what's going on? What's your story? Um, what happened? Um, Get to know the person. Get to know their story. Find out where they came from, and you will understand how they came to the place that they are. Everyone has a story. And if we'll just take time to get to know people's story, gosh, there'll be so much less hostility in the world. Um, here's a beautiful Thanksgiving banquet, at least to me. You know, your view of Thanksgiving might not even involve a turkey. I don't even know. But to me, if you say feast, this is what I'm thinking of. So imagine someone says to you, and of course, your picture might be different. But imagine someone says, hey, I want you to come over and have a feast at my house. And if you're a single person, it's just you. And if you're married and have a family or whatever, it's your family, right? So they say, we want you to come over to our house, just you guys. We want to throw a feast for you. And what's your favorite food? And they just you know, take notes. So then you come to their house and you look at the table and it's just decked out with all that kind of beautiful food, like just the most beautiful food you've ever seen. But then you look and you count the chairs. If you're a single person, there's just one chair there. If you're, if you're just a married couple, there's two chairs. And if you're a family of four, there's four chairs. And you look at the chairs and you say, are we all going to sit here? Where are you going to sit? And the host said, oh, no, no, we're not going to sit with you. We're going to sit in the other room on the other side of the house. We're going to eat separately from you. We're not going to be visiting with you. You're going to eat here by yourself, but you're going to have fun. You're going to enjoy it. 
and you're like, well, actually, I was hoping that we could like talk and have a conversation while we eat. Oh, no, 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 no. No, we're here to serve you. We're not here to get to know you. That would seem strange. And it wouldn't seem hospitable. Because hospitality is not about having a clean house, even though I think that's kind of important and our house is clean. It's not about having good food, although I think my wife's a great cook and I think we have good food. Hospitality is about paying attention to the guest. That is the most important value in hospitality. If you want to be a friend, if you want to be ruled by compassion, if you want to recognize that every outsider is a potential insider and that with God's help, many of them will become insiders, then you're going to have to pay attention to people by being emotionally present to them. Get to know the person as a person. Don't try to argue your point of view. I'll just go ahead and tell you this. They don't care about your point of view. Just get to know them as people. Understand. Seek to understand. I think we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen twice as much as you speak. The second thing, and the last thing I'm going to share with you is this. Compassion requires submitting to our guest. Compassion requires submitting to our guests. Submitting is about coming under voluntarily someone else. It's about choosing to be under the authority of someone else. Now, Jesus is literally the master. And so when Mary comes and sits at his feet and listens to him, she's literally submitting to him because she should, right? He's the master. So she's listening to what he has to say, which is clearly what he wants. Martha, on the other hand, has, is ruled by not Jesus, but her own personal intuition. She's serving Jesus the way she feels like Jesus should be served. So she's not listening to Jesus and what he wants. She's doing what she thinks he should want. She's ruled by intuition, not by Jesus. Jesus isn't her master. And so when she tells her master to get onto her sister, her master pulls rank and says, no, I'm the master. I'm not telling her anything. We are to treat every guest the way we would treat Jesus himself. And that's the message here. The Samaritan treated the man who had fallen among thieves as you and I would have treated Jesus himself if you were to walk down the street, drive by the road, you see someone on the side of the road, you pull over, you're not sure if he's a homeless man, if he's just drunk and passed out or if he's dead or wounded, and you pull over, what you do next, if it looks like what the good Samaritan did, I'm pretty sure you're treating that person the way you would treat Jesus himself. Here's a big uh, juicy steak. Some of you guys love this stuff, some don't, that's okay. Um, this one's like medium rare. It actually looks pretty good. I don't eat a lot of steak, but this one looks pretty good. Um, so imagine someone comes over to your house and you've made a big juicy steak for them. And you say, I've got a great steak for you. This is the best cut of steak ever. And they say, I'm actually a vegan. Would you say to that person, well, tough it out, man. This is a good steak. This is the juiciest thing you've ever put in your mouth. It's going to melt in your mouth. This is like heaven, man. Get over yourself. Would you say that to your guests? Get over your vegan self and just eat my steak. I would hope you would not do that, okay? I suspect no one here would do that. Let's say that the person has been working for like two weeks straight without a break. They arrange to come over on a Saturday, their first day off in two weeks. They come over, and you've got activities scheduled from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and they say, you know what I really want to do? I, say, I just want to take a nap, man. I am just so tired. Would you say to that person, dude, I've already spent money on this. I've been planning this for hours. We're going to have fun until eight o'clock and we're not going to stop. And if you want to sleep, you can sleep when you're dead or tonight. Okay. But well, we're going to have fun today. Would you do that? You'd probably say, well, you know what? We could just cut out some of the stuff we were planning. Why don't you, um, Hey, I've got a couch in the other room. You can have it. How about you just uh, take a nap? I'll bring you a blanket. We'll close the door. And when, when you've, uh, rested, if you finish before eight o'clock tonight, we'll find something else to do. We'll do something else. That's what you would probably do because you would serve your guest. If your guest was allergic to nuts, would you make them eat banana nut bread? I mean, probably not. If it would kill them, you wouldn't say, hey, we worked hard on this banana nut bread. You're going to eat it. And you're going to like it. No, you wouldn't do that. That's not guest friendly. Hospitality is submitting to the guest. So what I'm challenging you to do and what I think Jesus is teaching is that we put the needs of the other person ahead of ourselves. And it's what they want, not what we want. You know the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, I heard a speaker one time say that we should actually follow the platinum rule, which is do unto others as they would have them do unto you. And I would say that's probably true as long as what they want you to do unto them is biblical. Uh, maybe a better way to state the platinum rule is treat other people 
the way you would treat Jesus himself. Uh, this speaker said that he went, uh, he traveled a lot as a speaker and he was in an airport and he had a very short layover and he was hungry. And he looked at all the lines and the lines were all too long. And he realized that he wouldn't be able to get his food and, and eat it and get back on the next plane. But there was one place with no line and it was a pretzel place. So he went up to the pretzel place and he looked around at the menu and he, the guy came over and it was the owner. And uh, my friend, this guy who spoke, he said, um, hey, could I get a pretzel without the butter or the salt? And the guy says, I can't make a pretzel that way. He says, no, 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 I'm saying, and when you bring it out of the oven, before you slap on and lather it up with butter and pour the salt on it, just don't do those two things. Just give it to me right out of the oven. He goes, I, I can't do that. He goes, yeah, physically you can do that. You can just give it to me right after the oven. He goes, no, I would not do that. I would never do that. And my friend's like, why? That's how I want it. He goes, I would never, ever serve anyone a pretzel without butter and salt. Are you kidding me? I would never do that. And my friend said, but that's all I'm asking for. That is all I want. And the guy says, never. Well, that's not good hospitality, is it? I mean, is it the customer? In his, isn't his preference right? I mean, if you can give a guy a plain, nasty pretzel, wouldn't you just give him a plain, nasty pretzel if that's what he wants? Treat other people the way you would treat Jesus himself. When I see stuff that people say on Facebook and other social media to each other, I think to myself, would you speak to Jesus that way? Would you use that tone and that language to Jesus himself? I'm pretty sure you wouldn't. That should be our guide to treat everyone you meet, whether you know everything about them and hate them or know nothing about them and are scared of them, treat everyone you meet, insider and outsider alike, the way you would treat Jesus himself. That is our standard. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you have set the bar high for us. And that you have given us a model through Jesus of what it looks like to live this out. To be ruled by compassion, not by fear. To love without boundaries. To show hospitality to each and every person by being present to them. And by putting their needs ahead of our own. Father, help us to live that way. And to be different from everyone around us. Because we live differently. And we don't live with an us versus them but that we seek to understand every point of view and love every single person. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. All right. Uh, while um, we share the screen here, uh, let me just say this. There um, are no announcements today uh, that I know of. I just got back, so I'll find out tomorrow what should be announcements. Uh, but giving, let me share about giving. Um, we obviously can't pass the basket in this context, um, but giving has been awesome. Uh, I've noticed in the newsletter, it's continued to be like really awesome while I've been gone. So this whole summer, we've actually gotten better, not worse during COVID-19. So that's a tribute to you guys. You guys are amazing. Uh, here's the ways you can give. You can give by mail. Just make checks payable to Oasis and mail them to that address right there. You could also give in a way that's not on here, bill pay. A lot of people now use bill pay through their bank, and that's usually a free service for most of us. Uh, you're welcome to give that way. In fact, if you give that way, not a penny comes out. Uh, if you give online, a few pennies come out to PayPal, but not very much. And uh, if that's the easiest way for you to give, we would love for you to give that way. In fact, that's the one that's growing the fastest these days at Oasis, is to give online. And you just go to oasisaz.com invest and give that way, and you can give immediately that way. And so uh, regardless of how you give, let me just say thank you for being so generous. Um, uh, I, I love being back. I'm so glad to be back uh, after five Sundays of missing all of you guys. And I look up to catching up with you over the next few weeks. Um, but let me close our uh, service in prayer. And then if you guys want to hang around and visit, we can do that. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for their generous hearts. Um, I thank you for the way they serve each other. Father, I pray that you would help us to be distinct from a lot of other people in our culture on the right and left these days by not being highly partisan, by not being polarizing in our language or tone, but to be kind and generous and grace-filled and inclusive, to treat everyone as someone you love who could potentially be part of the body of Christ because Jesus died for all of them.
Father, help us to love that way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.